helping believers in Jesus Christ shine as bright lights in a dark world. Helping everyday Christians succeed in evangelism, ministry, and the Christian life. This is the Morning Star Bright Lights Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to Morning Star Bright Lights Podcast. Today is our first video podcast, so I'm so excited that you guys have chosen to join us in this conversation. Today our guest is Amanda Belzario? Belisario. Belisario. So um, I'm just so glad you're here. And why don't we just start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I grew up here in Massachusetts, in Worcester. Um, moved here to Central Mass when I was three and really was raised in a Christian home. Um, so I grew up here, went to Christian school most of my life until junior high. Junior high and high school was public school and so you went from a Christian school to a public school? Yes. How was that for you? I loved it. You I was did. totally fine with the transition. There was a lot of transition anyways within our family, um, changing churches and things like that. So it was just a season of change, but I loved going to public school. Um, obviously, junior high is junior high, and those are years I would never want to go back to. Um, but then high school was great. But then for me... My junior high and high school experience, I had friends at school, but my life was lived outside of school. In the church. My, yes, my yeah. circle of friends or my church friends, my youth group friends. So youth group was really my core and where my social life came from. That's really great because I know my kids went to a private school and then when they went over to the public school, it was like a shocker. My daughter would come home and be like, nobody listens to the teacher. Nobody listens. She didn't know what to do. So good for you. That sounds like you had a great beginning there. So I also did it a lot longer ago than she did. So. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like now I'm like 25 plus years out of high school. So we'll just true. leave it at that. True. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> different know, different day and age. Yeah. True. Um, so did you go off to college after you graduated or? No, nope, I never went not. to college. You did My not. dream was to be a stay at home mom. And so I said, I don't need a college degree for that. And so then I just went working. I, my senior year of high school, I had done a site internship with Doherty. It was a program that they had. And so What's I, that? What site? I forget what the acronym stood for. Maybe students in the environment. I don't even know. Students in the environment. I'm not even sure. Okay. Um, but it was an opportunity where for one of your classes, you went and volunteered, interned at a business or organization within okay. the community. And it helped you just experience something that maybe you had interest in. So mine was at the Worcester Art Museum. So I worked in, I interned in the education department and then ended up getting hired there and worked there for seven years. Went on to a multimedia production company from there. Worked there for a handful of years. Went a on, multimedia production? So what did yeah. you do there? I was the traffic manager there, which gives people totally a different image of what I did. They think I'm in a yellow vest and orange cones and everything. I always got the jokes but really it was a office manager and just making sure that all of the projects, the traffic were moving along. Okay. So all of the web design, all the print, all the graphic, all the animations, all the video production. Uh, so then I got to learn a lot of stuff from behind the scenes. And so now it's enough to make me dangerous and attempting at my own video editing and audio and okay. <laughs> graphic design and things like that. Every job that I had since high school, I may not have gone to college, but every job taught me something. And now within the ministry and the church, now I use it all. I use every single skill that I use. So God was just within. preparing you. Yeah. He was. Yeah. Yep. So um, you're married. I am. You're actually a pastor's wife. I am now. And yeah. you have children. I have one. We have one daughter. You do. Okay. Yeah. And how old is she? The countdown is on to age 11. Okay. We are within days. Oh, so about a week and a half. She's young. Yes, she okay. is. Okay. She makes us, everyone doesn't know our age because we have an 11 year old daughter. Okay. <laughs> yes. She's our disguise. I love that. Yep. Um, so how did you meet your husband? In his living room. Um, he and I were each attending individually Liberty Churches. He was attending the Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury. campus. Yeah. He was attending the Shrewsbury campus. And at the time is when they had their New England Dream Center. And I was attending the Dream Center uh, campus in Worcester. And that was just a season of healing 
for me. It's I was there at that church for all of two, maybe two and a half years, but I think it was just about two years long enough for God to just do a deep healing work within my life. I met some amazing people that poured into me and uh, they had at the time when I had first started going, their young adult group had just started. I don't know if it was getting like re-kicked off or whatever, but a new young adult pastor had come on staff and everything and they would have it on Tuesday nights. But then I showed up and it's like 40, 50 young adults. It's like a church service for young adults. And so I was talking to the young adult pastor. I said, there's got to be a way to like get to know people here. But right now it's like 40, 50 people. How do you do that? He goes, oh, this guy, Craig, he hosts a Bible study in his home. And so I'll connect you with him and we'll get you over there. I'm like, great, perfect, small groups. I love, I'm a people person, but I do like just opportunities of getting together in a smaller setting. So ultimately I met him for the first time in his living room. He was hosting the Bible study But then that was even like 25, 30 people crammed into his living room because it was just a season when everyone was just so hungry for the Lord and got some amazing friends out of that group. Craig and I were just strictly friends, didn't even kind of look at each other. I mean, we were good friends, but there wasn't even that interest for a whole year. And truly, I think that was God just putting the blinders on, letting us just be. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just so. sitting here and I'm thinking, how old are you? Because I remember the Dream Center. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm thinking you were a teenager when, when you went to the Dream Center? No. Okay. I wasn't. So are young adults in your 20s. 20s? Okay. 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 Because nope. I'm thinking, wow. No, I was in my late 20s. Okay. Yeah. So you eventually ended up liking each other. And yeah. So then all of a sudden, I. Um, he was a bachelor and he, he even admits it. So I'm not letting anything out of the bag, but he had like hot dogs and pasta and cereal in his cupboards. And that was it. And so I said, I'm going to show you how to cook some super simple meals. Cause this is ridiculous. You can totally be eating better than this. And went over taught him how to make a super simple meal. We got talking. I was encouraging him with some stuff and, I guess words of encouragement could be a love language for him because then the rest is history. And then we started praying about whether or not we would start seeing each other. Because if we did, it would be with intentionality to get married. It wouldn't be just to hang out more. And then God used it and we dated for a year. And then once we got engaged, it was get married within a few months. Because at that point, we're older, we're established. We don't, we're not looking to graduate anything. We're not looking to save up money for anything. We were you guys were all adults. in your own jobs, yeah. making your own money, doing yeah. your own life. Our own homes. Yeah. yeah. We just, yeah. we were already established. So we were like, okay. And then in hindsight, we're like, okay, we planned our wedding in like two months. So we didn't have to wait three months, but we thought we needed a little time, but we could have so gotten th- married a month earlier, but oh, well, we waited. <laughs> wow. I thought I was fast. I think we dated for an, a year and a half and then planned for a year and a half, but I guess you guys were. Yeah. We got engaged in March, mid-March and we're married mid-June. So So, how long have you been married? Now we're on the countdown for that too. In about two weeks, then it's 15 years. 15 years. And that blows my mind. I just, it seems like a blink. It doesn't even seem like it's been 15 years. It has. I've been married 30 years. Yep. Like double. (laughs) I'm still trying to wrap my head around all this. We started later in life. (laughs) So crazy. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. Got everything all set up. Yeah, we were young. I was like 23, I think, when we got married. So how did this come about? Because now you're a pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. So was this at all what God, you felt like God called you to do or did it just develop over time? It developed over time. Um, And I'm sure God was planting the seeds and we didn't, I don't know if we, probably we just weren't thinking about it, really weren't aware of it. I remember vividly a time when Craig and I, we're getting together with his best friend growing up and his parents who were like spiritual parents to Craig. They were the family that really um, introduced Craig to the Lord and he became a Christian through the relationship with them and everything. So they became spiritual parents to him. They were the one to raise them up in what a man of God looks like. And this is how you act. This is how you behave. This is what God's word says. Who raised him up? His spiritual parents. So From the Bill and Helen Minarella. So he started going to church on his own and then... His friend in high school then had invited him to youth group. Okay. And attended youth youth group 
purely social engagement and everything. And then in college, God gripped his heart and he came to know the Lord. And so Bill and Helen really raised them up. And so I remember vividly, we sat there at a lunch with them. This was shortly after we got married. And in this season, Craig was seeking the Lord and really what God had for him next, because he had been in Christian education for 19 years. He was an elementary school teacher. He did the gym teacher thing, the classroom teacher thing. He worked his way into the administration and was a principal and he loved it and he thrives in it. You get him around elementary school age kids and he is this totally other person. Uh, He just engages so well with them. Um, But he knew that God was calling him away from that. And so he was seeking the Lord on what he had for him. And uh, that must have been super difficult. My husband's a teacher and we're looking at different, you know, ventures. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, and I tell him, you're not leaving. Like that's literally our retirement. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, but Christian education, I don't think would really give a great retirement, oh, okay. but so probably was, within public oh, education. Sure. So he was in a private school. <laughs> private Christian, okay. small private Christian okay. elementary school. It's a junior high, I think it was. Um, and so we were talking and I, I'm just naturally an encourager. I am positive to a fault. He is pessimistic to realist. We kind of meet each other in the realist world, but really I'm optimistic and he's pessimistic and we just balance each other out that way. And so we're sitting there talking with Bill and Helen and everything. And Helen and I were both like, Craig, you're a teacher. But the thing is you're passionate about God's word. We truly just in that moment, both of us, even though this is probably the second time I had met them, And both of us were just encouraging him going, really consider teaching God's word, whatever that way looks like, but you're an amazing teacher and you're passionate about God's word. And then we walked away from it and then nothing really came from, it's not like from that conversation, that's how it all happened. So God wasn't, he didn't bring it up. You saw something in him. We saw something and, but that's just kind of how God has worked with Craig and I. I'll just make these little comments about things and seeds will start to get planted or whatever. And then all of a sudden, everything just starts to move into place. So do you feel like you um, pray about your marriage or pray about him and like start seeking God? Like, is there something new or is it just in your prayer time that God will start throwing nuggets like about your husband? I think it's just even in the moment sometimes that I just try and seek the Lord in everything that I say and do in the way that I live my life. His word is truth. It is what we live our life on. I feel like when you're, when you live a life trying to be so aware of the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then maybe that's just a gifting that God has given me of just being able to speak into certain situations at times. Um, I, Venture to say a prophetic gifting, but not in the way that a lot of people think about prophetic gifting. I think it's just, I just get these like little seeds of insight. And so I just- In the moment. Speak it and share it. And it's not like, this is going to come to pass on this day, on this. It's nothing like that. It's just, no, nope. I think, and I, I just share what I feel like I'm getting prompted by the Holy Spirit in that moment and let it, and then it just kind of, um, and then you leave it alone. and boils. Yep. So you just leave it alone. You speak it. And then he may come back to you later and say, hey, remember when you said, I've been praying about that? Or does he it may, just or sometimes of- I think he may even forget what I've said, but the seed has been planted. And so now it can ruminate there. And then God works it all out. My, something my parents, my parents did marriage ministries. That's a whole other topic. And but they I? did. They did, they started with MMI before it was MMI um, when it was Nova Shalom. So way back in the day, and then it became MMI. And so they worked with marriage ministries. And so the thing that my mom really instilled within me was a saying of pray it on them, don't lay it on them. And that is a hundred percent what I do. I refuse to be what someone would coin a nagging wife, but I just pray it on them. I don't lay it on them. Even if there's something that I'm sensing, I just... Pray it and say, Lord, 
bring this to be, bring it to pass, whether it's me speaking it in the right season or God just bringing someone else to speak it in the right season. And when it came to Craig becoming a pastor, then that was through when we had been searching for a church, because at that point we um, had felt that we needed to leave Liberty Church. It just, the season was up and we both felt individually that God was calling us from that. That was right before we got engaged. And so we started searching for churches and we'd visit churches for a month, month and a half at a time. And so we had visited multiple churches. So we landed at First Assembly of God in Worcester. Now that's the church I grew up in from the age of three to about 10, 11 years old. So for me, I felt like it was boomerang and kind of going back to the beginning. I was like, this is weird. Like, this is just strange to be back, whatever. So we visited there for a while, left, went, visited somewhere else for a while. Um, weren't feeling at peace with any of those places and felt like we needed to go back to First Assembly. We went back and there is a service that we left. And as we're driving out of the parking lot, this is the first of many times when we both looked at each other and said, we don't know why, because we're not taken by amazing worship or amazing facilities or whatever. Pastor Brian was preaching the word and the word was solid, but we both looked at each other and said, in our own fleshly bodies, we're not saying, yes, this is the church, but we just knew that the Holy Spirit was calling us there. And in that mm-hmm. moment, as we were driving out of the parking lot, we were driving by the parsonages there. And it was a moment when I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, I have something for Craig here. There's a future. I had no idea. And I go, that would freak him out. And I just kept my mouth shut. And we just kept going. <laughs> we just kept moving. It, we made it our church home. We hosted the young adult group. This was before Juliet. Um, everything. Craig continued to search and seek the Lord on what he had. Long story short, Craig ended up volunteering time for Pastor Brian at the church, just helping out, saying, I've got the time on my hands. Let me just serve. Was he still a teacher? Nope. He had stepped away in faith, which is a whole other God okay. thing too. Okay. That, there's so many God moments. Um because Craig is a personality where if you don't have something to go to, you don't quit your job until you go to it. But when the Lord tells you to do something, then you do it. And the, and the Lord had made it very clear for him to step away. So he stepped away from his job. He did. didn't have a job. Correct. You had a job. Yes. And so he just decided to start helping out at the church. Helping out the church. Mm-hmm. He had other um, side gigs mm-hmm. and things like that that he was doing. So he had income coming in, but it wasn't like that career path. Right. And then Pastor Sometimes Brian. Sometimes I think that that's the way it is. Just, yeah. you know, you have to step back a little bit at a time. Mm-hmm. And then um, just to allow God to put all those things together. Yeah, it is. It's, he definitely works it all out. And so then this was one of those moments where then Pastor Brian had invited Craig to go play golf. And on Craig knows the hole. He can picture it. He knows exactly the moment. Um, pastor Brian approached him. Hey, have you ever thought about being a pastor? And Craig in his gut was like, nope, <laughs> it's like, really? I'm not going to do it. Okay. And, but the seeds even after were you had seed, you had said that to him. I honestly think that he wasn't even aware of it. He wasn't, again, it's like it kind of went in, settled, whatever. And long story short, he ended up coming on part-time staff at the church. Now, did he come home and tell you that he said that? Yes. And what did you say? I said, that would be amazing. You'd be okay. great at it. So you confirmed it. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, you knew. Oh, yeah. No, I'm like, that would be amazing. Obviously, um, God was working everything out and everything. And there, it's this whole long story and process of how it all came to be. And God was just preparing him. He was just stepping him through it all. And, but not only him, you. you know, yeah. Because, you know, to be a pastor's wife is a big calling. Maybe yeah. some people don't see it that way because that way, it's yeah. like, oh, it's just a pastor's wife. But yeah. it really is a big calling. You have to have a heart for it. Yeah, you do. And it, um, it's just funny because I think the Lord was even preparing me for it in a way. All in, I had been out to dinner with a friend and got talking and out of my mouth, all of a sudden said, yeah, I'd o- I always wanted to marry a pastor. And when I said it, I'm like, what? Like, that's weird. I've never had that thought in my life. My grandfather was a pastor and 
my parents had always been in ministry, not in any pastoral role or anything, but always very active in our church. I grew up just being active in the church. I, as soon as I was out of youth group, I was serving in the youth group. I was just helping out in women's ministry, even at a young age, just always active, serving in nursery, whatever. And then when that came out of my mouth, I'm like, where did that come from? Just move past it, whatever. And then all of a sudden, it's years later, then it's all working its way out. I find that that's true because the Lord will put things on my heart and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And then 10 years later, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And so it's something that you just kind of ponder and leave there. And you're like, okay, I get those for my daughter too. Mm-hmm. Like I, I can picture her doing something. And, I, and so every time something may happen, I immediately go to that promise. Yeah. And I'm like, no, because I'm going to see that. Yeah. I'm going to see that. It'll come so, to fruition someday. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I I agree with that. I can see that happening. So when he stepped into the role, was he an associate pastor at that church? Because you guys just planted a new church. We did. Five, um, coming up five years, September. Five, like five years, years. In Charlton. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so this was now, if Juliet's going to be 11, then it was about 11 years ago. He took on a part-time pastor job when I was pregnant, like within months of giving birth to Juliet. And so he was working part-time and I had a dream of being a stay-at-home mom. So again, it was a step of faith. He knew my heart's dream of being a stay-at-home mom and we just relinquished it over to God. And said, okay, God, you've got this. And, and you never went back to work. Well, I did go back to work. I did my maternity leave, went back for three months. But then within that time, then he ended up becoming on full-time. Okay. We were li- then we moved into the parsonage that we were driving by on that Sunday when God spoke to me and said, this is where you're to be. And that's and what I love I too. That's what I love too. Because uh, when I was dating my husband, I remember sitting in church one day. I was saved. He was not. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in church one day and, oh my gosh, he went to church with me every day. He went to Bible studies with me, wasn't saved. And then... I remember sitting next to him and you know, the prayers at the end of the service and I'm sitting there and I felt like he, he just, he just gave his life to the mm-hmm. Lord. Like I knew it. Like mm-hmm. all of a sudden I just felt the Holy Spirit say that. And I looked at him and I was like, this is it. We left. He never said anything to me. And I was like, okay, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, I felt like that's what the Lord was saying, but maybe not. And then literally like what, six months later, he asks me to marry him. And I go, no, nah, I can't do that. Like, well, I don't, cause you're not saved. You know, I can't get into that kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, he goes, I did the prayer at the end. I said, when? And immediately the Lord brought me back to that spot. And I was like, why didn't you ever tell me? But it was that piece of knowing this is real. Yeah, This is real. It was like, just God's confirming that. And uh, he's like, well, that's just between me and God. You know, and I was like, it's no big deal. You need is, to know this information. <laughs> yes, of course I did. Of course I did. But so, yeah, so that's really awesome. I love that. Yeah. How God will do that. Place that inside of you. It's, it's like this hope that you know is there and you can just continue on knowing that it'll happen. Mm-hmm. So you guys moved on, you have your own church and tell me what have been, you're such a positive person. So I'm going to get real. There's got to be, something in there that you find is tough being a pastor's wife. And do you like being called a pastor's wife or does that bother you? Like, do you feel like you don't have your own, you know, identity in the Lord by saying that or are you all right with that? I am okay with that. And I think I also grew up, I grew up kind of not with my own identity. I was always Bob and Karen Hicks's daughter. And then, uh, um, so now I joke around, I, Finally got out from being Bob and Karen Hicks's daughter. And then I was Amanda. And then all of a sudden Craig became a pastor. So now I'm, oh, I'm Pastor Craig's wife. And that's how you were introduced to me. This is Pastor Craig's wife. (laughs) It's like, what's her name? (laughs) But then I'll even introduce myself to new people at church saying, I'm Amanda. I'm Pastor Craig's wife. And just to help make the connection. So people see me sitting up there with him. So hopefully they're assuming everything proper, but just to make sure everything's above board. Like we are married. (laughs) We go together. Um, so no, I don't mind it at all. So do you find that transition um, overseeing people in a church, like in a spiritual way, do you find you struggle with that? Or what would you say is tough about that? Or do you find it not at all? 
it took a little while to be tough and I was okay with that uh, because when we were in Worcester, then Craig came, was an associate. So we had that covering from Pastor Brian and his wife, Glory Ann, and uh, they just really nurtured and poured into us and mentored us in those roles. And so then when we came to Charlton, I was super excited about it. I couldn't see how anything could go wrong or how anything could be negative or whatever. I was excited about it. I was excited to kind of make this our own and create the culture that we wanted there in Charlton. Which you have, so, by the way. I've you. heard <laughs> great reviews, if you want to say, from that church and just how down to earth you guys are and loving and literally a family over there. Mm-hmm. It's really is. It's the, there's two huge compliments that I love if or when we ever get them. The first is I felt at home the minute I walked walked in here, I felt so loved and accepted and cared for the minute I walked in. And then the other is you're preaching God's word and I'm learning so much. I'm like, yes, those are, and those are Craig and I. I am told, I'm the hugger. So I have to slow down and say, can I give you a hug? <laughs> like I need to not assault people with my hugs and my very joyful personality. Cause that can I'm be like off I'm a hugger too. And I always look at my husband like, oh shoot, should I have hugged that person? Should I have not? You right. know, like, is there I, a double check here? Because I'm very like, yeah. or I'll grab your arm. Like, oh wait, I wanted to talk to you and be I'm like. touchy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I get it. I get but it. But I've learned, I need to kind of slow down, mm-hmm. read the room, read mm-hmm. the person. Um, and then Craig is just passionate about God's word and just really teaching it. And that's why when First Assembly of God renamed to Living Word Church, it was all around the time that we were about to launch Charlton. We said, well, we'll let you pick the name for Worcester and then we'll see if we're going to use the same name or not. And as soon as they decide on Living Word, we're like, well, yeah, we're going to be Living Word of Charlton then because that completely encompasses what we want and who we so are. So you're still a sister record. church. We are. We're like a daughter church to okay. them. Um, we're still within their covering. Their elder board is oversees us as well. Um, so we still have that covering since we're still young and growing and trying to cover ourselves. So have you found any parts that you struggle with? So that came probably a couple of years in to Charlton. And that is when it was just the relational side of everything. That's when I realized I am a people person. I know I'm a people person, but when I realized that all of my people can't just be within our church body, just for my own self-care and support, I can't. I can't talk about just anything with anybody within our church body. I'm a very open book. So people get like 98% of me, but then there's a side of it where it's like, Hey, I'm a pastor's wife. I still need to protect my husband, support my husband. And there still needs to be things that are kept within us and that are for the health of the church. And so for me to realize that I kind of needed to rein back in some ways and then also have a support system outside of our church. I'm still working on establishing that support system, but I know that I need to have it. And I know that I do have one very dear friend um, that I can pick up the phone at a moment's notice to text or call her. She is in the same role. She gets it. Her husband's a pastor as well. And we can just connect in that way. And we can go for four, five, six months without talking. We just pick up right where we left off. And we know that we're there for each other. We know that we will pray for each other. We know that we will understand where each other's coming from, the hurts, the struggles, Mm -hmm. the challenges, the good stuff, bad stuff, all of it. Do you find the struggles come from um, just people in the church and speaking into their lives? or like being a pastor's wife and that? No, I think it's being a pastor's wife and a lot of people have a lot of opinions. And when we're all such good friends, so to speak, then everyone's willing to share their opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. But then sometimes you're like, you just want to shrug your shoulders and be like, I don't know what to tell you right now. <laughs> like, Okay. It is what it is. Okay. And this is, just a season or whatever it may be. So if people just bring to you about something that's happening in the church or personalities and stuff like that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Or sometimes they think that I 
control Craig. And I'm like, I don't control Craig. Craig is Craig. Craig is his own man. He's the pastor. And I have respect for him just as I hope that you'll have respect for him that he is seeking. So oftentimes what I say is he's seeking the Lord in every decision that he's making. Therefore, I just need to trust that he's doing what God's calling him to do. Um, And I'm going to support him in that. Do you get any, any any conversations with him about that stuff or because you made a mention earlier that you're pretty more silent prayer. Do you ever feel like you have to have those conversations with him or is that something you just continue to take to the Lord? No, we'll have conversations. Well, there will yeah. be times that there are just situations that arise or whatever and we definitely talk it out. And we, thankfully, he and I just have the ability to just, talk and unload on each other and everything, just whatever it is of the day, the dynamics of the day, and just be able to talk it all out and vent it all out. And we go, okay, well, now let's pray about that. We kind of got all of our human emotions and feelings out there. Now let's give it to the Lord and let's trust him to work this out. And just that he's going to guide us. He's going to give us wisdom in whatever situation it is, um, whatever challenge it is that we're facing, because hey, let's face it, the church, just because um, people are believers in Christ doesn't make them perfect. The church is just a whole bunch of imperfect people. And guess what? The pastor and the pastor's wife is a whole bunch of imperfect people too. So anyone who is thinking that they're above any of this, well, then they're going to be in for a really big hard fall. And I think Um, that that's what everybody needs to realize is that a lot of times a church will fall apart because of a pastor, because of that. And you can't put your eyes on a pastor. Yeah, It has to be on God. 100%. And to know yeah. that literally we're humans. Yeah. And I will, and you can ask any woman in our ladies Bible studies, they know that I've mentioned it multiple times saying, hey, Craig preaches on Sundays, but guess what? You need to be in the word. And take what he says on Sundays and go double check it. If he misspoke, guess what? He's a human and that's okay. But you do what the word of God says. So whether or not he misquotes scripture accidentally, or you're listening to anyone on TV, on the radio, wherever, on a Christian podcast, whatever, you sift everything you hear through the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, then don't go by what the person's saying. Go by what the word of God says. And that's why my other big thing besides cross-referencing things with scripture is read things in context. Right. Don't just take a verse for a standalone and make it what you want it to say because that's not what it is. Everybody does that now. Says. Everybody does. And I think it was really, really big in the 90s. That's like my childhood memories of, I feel like there's all these like coin scriptures. And then all of a sudden you go back to them now as an adult. And you're like, that's when, not what it meant. And you're like, that is not, when you read that in context, that is not what it means. If I tithe, it does not mean I'm going to be a millionaire. No, it means that guess what? My needs will be met. Well, guess what? I have a whole lot of wants, but God's meeting my needs. Mm -hmm. I may not have my beach house on the ocean or the lake, but guess what? I have a house over my head and I have food on my table. Therefore, I am being blessed because I am giving back to the Lord first. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. We just take so many things out of context and it, I do know exactly. I do know exactly what you mean. You just look at the life of Jesus. Mm-hmm. That yeah. says it all right there. He didn't have a beach house. No. Did his disciples have a beach house? No. No. Unless no. they were tenting alongside the beach right. on that night. <laughs> right. The chosen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like that movie. <laughs> Walking um, on the water. <laughs> right. So you now serve, or is it a job? Or do you serve? It's Barnabas? It's a job. Okay, it, it is. is. A job. It's okay. slowly increased over time, but Barnabas Ministries. So tell me about that because this whole podcast is being a light. Mm-hmm. And that to me, when I was reading a little bit about that, you guys are really bringing together some pastors and ministering to each other. Is yeah. So can you just share a little bit about that? Sure. And I'll even first share a really quick connection because I alluded to it a little bit in some of our notes in the fact that All of these different things about Craig and I coming together, about Craig becoming a pastor, about me becoming um, joining Barnabas Ministries to work for them, God has woven it all together. When Craig and I were friends, not even dating yet, we were in the Bible study, he started our young adult group 
off on anyone who wanted to a reading through the Bible chronological plan. And so a group of 10 or 12 of us started out doing it. And it was a Bible study reading through the year plan where you're reading it chronologically. So not necessarily just Genesis to Revelations, but in the order in which- I just did that last happened. year, yeah. So Dick Germain had written the Bible study plan that we were doing. Craig and I were the only ones to finish it. <laughs> Everyone else kind of dropped off over time, which is to be expected. A reading through a Bible and a year plan is not everyone's game. And sometimes it takes two to three years and that's okay. So Craig and I finished it. That's back when we were dating. By the end of it, we were dating. Um, so we were friends when we started, dating when it finished. And Dick Germain wrote that plan. Fast forward. He wrote the Bible plan that you guys were doing? Yes. Okay. Was it yep. in a year? It was a year. Okay. Plan. And so he wrote it. Fast forward a bunch of years now. Craig and I are married. We have Juliet. She's six. So now we're looking at like seven years later from doing that Bible study plan. A friend, a friend of ours at a church whom Craig had also attended their church at one season and had supported everything. It's all another mish, crossover story there. Then he started to work for Barnabas Ministries. Your husband? No, our friend, Rob okay. Woods. So he the started- The one who wrote the study. Dick Germain wrote the study. Okay. Now Rob Woods is now working for Barnabas Ministries. Uh, and- he calls Craig one day and says, so Craig, Barnabas Ministries, we're looking. Our ministry assistant at the time, uh, she's going to be retiring and we need to find somebody. And I just wasn't sure if Amanda would be interested in, in this job or not. And Craig's like, I don't know. Here, talk to her. Passes the phone off to me. He's telling me everything about the job. Well, it's only 15 hours a week. You'd have to work from home. We don't have offices and uh, but it's flexible, so you could work when you need to, as long as you're getting your hours done. And he's making it all sound like it's all bad things. And I'm over here saying, Rob, Rob, you don't understand. We moved into this house because the way God has done everything in our lives has led us to do things backwards from the world's economy. So like we buy a house and then I found my part-time job to then help supplement some of that income. And so we were a few months into the house and I'm like, are you kidding me? This is exactly Juliet's in preschool. I wanted flexibility. I wanted to be from home. I don't want a full-time job. I was about ready to waitress at a popular chain restaurant. Like we were on our way out the door to my second interview to be a waitress at a chain restaurant. And previously I'd been managing apartment building communities. And we're like, what is going on? And I'm like, I'm very interested in this. And so I went through the second interview at this chain restaurant and said, all right, well, my husband, I need to talk about it. So I'll let you know by the end of the weekend to buy myself some time then to look into this Barnabas Ministries gig. Went for the interview, met the executive director. He and I really hit it off as well. Thankfully, I said no to this other waitressing gig in a step of faith, thinking that hopefully Barnabas Ministries will work out. And it did. And now I've been with them for seven years. And over the course of seven years, I've slowly increased my time and now I'm full-time with them. And I absolutely love the ministry. I have become very passionate about unity within the church and within pastors themselves because the whole ministry is based upon John 17, 23. And that is um, in what that verse says is Jesus praying to the father where he says, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me. And now working with Barnabas Ministries and seeing their heart and passion to connect pastoral leaders across denominational lines so that they can come together a couple times a month and be connected. Um, the way I put it to the lay person um, is, hey, a pastor comes, um, everyone in the church comes to a pastor and gives them all their junk. Where is a pastor supposed to go? He can't go to someone in their church and say, you know, I've had a really bad day. Let me tell you all about it. Or guess what? My wife and I are fighting about this. We're just not getting on the same page. Let me tell you all about it. Pastors can't talk to anybody. 
So when they come together in what I would say like a home group, connect group type setting. So you just get three to five pastors together, getting together regularly. Now they're sharing their story. They're telling each other, this is my story. This is what's happened in my life up until this point. This is how I became who I am today. And then whenever they get together, then they engage in scripture together. They pray together. And then they just update each other on life. They're not there to automatically receive advice on your problems or anything like that. Now, if they want to ask advice, then sure, then they can do that. But no one is supposed to just automatically offer advice. You're there to listen to each other, to support each other. When they're engaging in scripture together, it's not there to preach your Sunday sermon. It's not there to um, share your deepest theological thoughts and discussions. It's there to read a passage and say, okay, in this moment now, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to each of us? Let's talk about that. So you're bringing together pastors from all different denominations Mm -hmm. in a little small group of their own that they can just be comfortable in and not have to worry. And now they can be themselves. Yeah. And we tell them to leave the titles at the door, which for some cultures... Uh, That's a little different here in America. I think it's easier to leave reverend, pastor, bishop, whatever at the door in some other cultures. That's a little bit more challenging, but we still encourage them to do that. So we're just Corinne and Amanda talking. Okay. Yeah. We're not pastor Amanda and reverend Corinne or whatever. But you don't join any of those groups. I do not because I'm not a pastor. I'm a pastor's wife, but I'm not a pastor. It is for pastoral leaders. So if someone is a children's pastor or a youth pastor or a young adult pastor and they are a woman, then great. Be a part of a John 17, 23 group. If you're a senior pastor, an associate pastor, um, uh, interim pastor, they're even uh, clergy or whatnot. As long as you're in a pastoral role where you're ministering, teaching God's word and discipling people with for Christ using God's word in that pastoral role, then a John 17, 23 group is for you. That's really great. And when I came on seven years ago, we were only approaching 300 pastors in groups. And I was in New England and West Michigan and North Georgia. What is it today? And now today we're almost to 1,723 pastors. If you get that, John 17, 23, and now we're almost to 17, 23. We're like on the cusp. I think we only need a couple more. Um, We're working out our numbers, fiscal year and numbers, and we're right there. And now that's across 25 countries. That's incredible. Just literally pastors coming together to be in a group. And I'd say minister to each other, but it's really just allowing the Lord to minister to them in more of a humble state where they're themselves. It is. But then what comes from that is that then they feel sustained. They feel strengthened. They feel encouraged. They feel equipped then to be able to do kingdom ministry. And oftentimes that results in doing kingdom ministry together. Okay. Even right now, right where we're at in downtown Worcester, only a few blocks away from where we're sitting doing this podcast right now, then there's Hope for Worcester that has um, done an outreach event. And oftentimes a lot of the pastors and their churches who come together to support that ministry, Hope for Worcester, to be able to do a huge outreach event, which now they have like seven different locations typically on their day of hope, then they go... And all of those pastors are more often than not John 17, 23 group pastors. Just all pulling together. They just all pulled together. And it just so happened to be that way. It wasn't anything that the first year um, that Hope for Worcester started doing it, that that was the intentionality. It's just, that's where the relationships are. So then once this pastor hears bad, then they're going to tell this pastor. And when this pastor hears bad, they're going to, or like the whole John 17, 23 group learned about it. And so then all their churches pitched in to do it. In the area, come together to minister to people. So being a light in their lives, they're able to go out into the community together Mm -hmm. and minister to everybody. I mean, that's just a blessing. And kingdom ministry can look um, very different in a lot of different areas. Uh, some churches, they come together and they do their Good Friday services together because they say, hey, this is a great 
opportunity for our three, four, five churches to all come together for a worship service together. And this is a good reason to do it, a good event time to do it. Um, Sometimes they've had prayer gatherings together. Some churches have gotten together and partnered together to create um, a transition home for men for sobriety and overcoming addictions. Um, We have other pastors in Kenya that then they went out and served together with a larger group of other pastors outside of groups. And then they saw over a hundred people come to know the Lord in one location. They went to another location and over 400 people came to know the Lord. So God's really moving. Yes. And he's so excited. And he's doing it by bringing pastoral leaders together. And then when these pastoral leaders come together and they're supported, that their congregations are healthier. When their congregations are healthier, then hopefully they can reach out to the community more. And then the community can see the love of God in action. People coming together instead of fighting against each other. Yeah. Yeah. That is so awesome. I want to thank you so much. This is just so great to see what you've been a part of and what God has been doing. Do you have anything that you could say like a scripture or encouragement for our listeners that, you know, if God, if they're feeling like a tug, you know, cause you just shared your entire life of just following God, you know, him putting things in your heart and then, you know, have just seeing them come to pass. Mm-hmm. What could you say to our listeners that would encourage him in that, you know, to step out in faith? You know, there's a, a lot of gifts that God has given each of us And unfortunately, it's the fear or is that really God, you know, and all of those things that the enemy can get in there. So it kind of stunts your growth and you're not able to step out into faith and uh, do what God's called you to do. So what what is something that you could say or that you've learned that could help our listeners to really just become all that God created them to be Mm -hmm. in boldness and in joy? Firstly, I'd say, hold everything loosely. I feel like so often we hold on to things so tight. And me, I'm a type A control freak. I have learned to chill out a lot over the years and I'm glad I have. Um, But at the same time, I can want things the way I want them and the way I expect them to be. And so I'd say, hold on to things loosely really trust the Lord and know that his plans and purposes are way bigger, way better than what we could ever hope or imagine. When I look back over even just the last 15 to 20 years of life and see everything that God has worked out and orchestrated within my life individually, and then Craig and I collectively, and then the ministries that we're involved with collectively, oh my goodness, God had way bigger, better plans than I even thought of or could have ever even hoped for. And it's really humbling to be able to sit back and watch and see it all transpire and just see people coming to relationship with the Lord or returning to relationship with the Lord, or maybe what they think as returning to the church, but really now they're getting to know the Lord in a very real and personal way. And they're starting to learn what the word of God says. And that brings excitement and joy that is the bee's knees of ministry. I mean, to tell you, it's just. <laughs> Where did that come from? The bee's knees. I know. I've never heard of that. You've never heard no, of that? No. Oh. I'm like, what is that? Wow, um, I'm dating myself and I'm younger than you. What's happening oh here? <laughs> so really, and I, I agree with that. Like if I look back and think about the different things that God put on my heart and you're like, yeah, okay. I don't know where that came from. Mm-hmm. And then 10, 15 years later, you're seeing that. But what's so cool in that is when it does come to pass, there is no pride in it. Mm-mm. It's all just walking like, okay, all right. I remember this, you know, when you get that, you know, God just brings you back to that time where he put that in your heart and you can just sit there and rest being like, God, you're just so good. You're oh, so good. He is so good. And Something I share with my daughter often, and I believe that this is even a reference that my mom wrote in my Bible when she had given me a new Bible, maybe in my early teen years, was Philippians 4, 6 through 8. And it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right and pure, lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Amen. And if we just keep our hands wide open, release everything to God and think on him, he is going to fill us with peace and he's going to direct our steps. And that's the best. So good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I'm sure that everybody's encouraged by this. Do you want to end us in prayer or? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to just be able to come and talk and give glory and honor to your name for all that you have done within our lives, within the ministry, within Barnabas Ministries, within Living Word Church of Charlton. Father, it is all by your hand and we give you glory and honor for it. Right now, I lift up pastors everywhere that they will all be able to learn about John 17, 23 groups and be connected within them so that they can be strengthened and encouraged and ready to do kingdom ministry together for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I want to thank our listeners for joining the conversation today. Praying the Lord spoke to each and every one of you and believing we can move forward together and shine as bright lights in our communities. For more information about today's guest, please be sure to go to the episode show notes. If you found this podcast engaging and encouraging, please consider subscribing to the podcast and sharing these episodes with your friends and family. It's the best way to help the Morning Star Bright Lights community grow together as we share our experiences and insights for reaching New England and the world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. If you or someone you know is shining the light of Christ and feels led to share what the Lord is doing and has done in and through your life, we would love to hear about it. Please go to podcast at morningstarbookstore.com and leave us a message. Visit our Morningstar Bookstore locations and discover our wide selection of Christian books, Bibles, and gifts. Also visit our website at morningstarbookstore.com for more selections and direct-to-home shipping. On behalf of the entire team at Morningstar Christian Bookstore, thanks for joining the conversation.